Keep 100% of your claim. Cheap for claims. If you've been hurt in a road accident that wasn't your fault, you should really talk to G4 Claims first. Unlike road accident solicitors, we don't charge you for our services, which could see you better off. To keep 100% of your compensation, have a chat with Nicole and the team. You'll be glad you did. Search online for G4 Claims. Keep 100% of your claim. G4 Claims. <laughs> Hi and welcome to this week's episode of the DW Podcast. I am joined by Connor Powell all the way from the States. How are you doing, Connor? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. No, thanks for thanks for coming on. It's it's nice to talk to someone else who has a podcast out there and you've done many over the years. Uh, you know, your your career, for those that are listening or watching in Scotland, I think it would be great to dive into a little bit about who is Connor Powell. Uh, and obviously touch on, many will know I'm a, a big football fan, as we call it here in, in the UK, or soccer to you. Uh, touch on your latest podcast series, The Lords of Soccer. Uh, because I think when you hear the title, people would probably think that it's a, a football or soccer podcast, but it's so much more than that. So yeah, who, who is Connor Powell? How would, how would you answer that? Yeah, thank you again for having me on. You know, I think I'm a journalist first and foremost. Um, I'm a sports fan and always have been. I think that plays a lot into this podcast, The Lords of Soccer, but I think I started uh, very much uh, as a journalist before I ever started doing sports podcasts or, you know, sort of corruption podcasts. Um, I was a journalist for several years in the United States, covered politics a little bit in 2018 and the, or sorry, in 2008 in the U.S. presidential election. And then in 2009, I moved to Kabul, Afghanistan as a freelance uh, reporter. And I didn't have a job. Uh, I didn't really fully know what I was doing, but uh, I rolled the dice and um, knew that the U.S. was about to send a surge of troops to Afghanistan, along with the U.K. and other countries as well. In that sort of 2009, 2010 period. So, and I really wanted to cover conflicts and wars. And so in 2009, I, I moved there in February. And within a couple of weeks, I was able to get a job. My first job um, was with Fox News, which I have, you know, I said pretty openly and honestly, it was never my dream place to work. Um, but it was an opportunity to cover what was at the time one of the biggest stories in the world. And, and in all honesty, Fox was in Afghanistan was a pretty pleasant company to work for. They treated me fairly well. I was halfway around the world, so I didn't really have to deal with a lot of the craziness that we all have come to realize and know about Fox. That's interesting. You, you touched on the, the 2008 presidential election there, and I think for many around the world watching that, and many in the States, you know, that was that was a landmark election. You know, it's your your first black president, Barack Obama, elected. How did you get into that? What what was your, your feeling on the ground? Uh, was it a shock over there? What were people, people telling you? And, and from there... What makes you want to go to Afghanistan? Because uh, I'm probably a bit of a scared day cat, so to speak, and the, the thought of going to a conflict zone would, would terrify me. Uh, never mind fighting, but even going there as a journalist, you know? Listen, it should terrify you. I mean, wars and conflicts should always terrify you. If they don't scare you, there's something really wrong. And, and I wouldn't pretend that I wasn't scared and haven't been scared. I was just in Ukraine a couple months ago. And uh, it, listen, places where people are being killed are scary and dangerous. Um, you know, going back to the 2008 election, I, I really started at the election in January of 2008, when at the time, Hillary Clinton had not won the Democratic nomination, nor had Barack Obama. It was just beginning, but Hillary Clinton was considered the front runner. And she had locked up what were called super votes or um, super delegates at the time. And it looked like there was no path for Barack Obama to win the Democratic nomination, let alone the presidency of the uh, of the United States. Right. In January 2008, it looked like it was going to be Hillary Clinton versus somebody else. And everyone thought Hillary Clinton. And so it was a fascinating race. And what you saw in 2008 as a journalist, what we saw in the United States was Hillary Clinton had sort of locked up all the traditional Democratic um, governors, congressmen, uh, all the people with like name ID and people who had like big mailing lists, but she hadn't actually locked up the democratic voters and they were hungry for something else. They were hungry for somebody who hadn't supported the Iraq war. 
um, somebody who is really going to be different than the Clinton brand or the Bush brand. And Barack Obama fit all of those. And, and over the course of several months, we saw Barack Obama build this coalition within the Democratic Party to win the nomination. And then we also saw him over the course of the summer and the fall of 2008, build a, this Democratic, independent, even some Republicans um, uh, coalition that launched them to, you know, to history of being the first black man to be president of the United States. So it was a really fascinating campaign that I don't think enough people really have studied um, the history of the campaign because there's so many other things to study about his presidency. What was your role at that time, Connor? What were you doing? Yeah, I was running for a TV station in Washington, D.C., uh, covering Capitol Hill, covering politics, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, you know, the, the first half of the year of 2008, I was covering a lot of the primary campaign. And then something started to happen in 2008 that was really interesting for me, which was the financial crisis began, right? We all remember the financial crisis of 2009, 2010. It, it began in the fall of 2008, but I was covering congressional hearings in the spring of 2008, and it was just called the housing crisis. People were losing their houses. These um, mortgages were uh, starting to be defaulted on in, in poor and low-income areas. But everybody, when you went to these hearings, kept saying, there was a bigger storm coming. But nobody knew what credit default swaps were. Nobody knew what you know, sort of the larger housing crisis was going to be. And, and I was covering it um, day in and day out, as well as the primary for the presidency. And it was really interesting because by September of 2008, the presidential election and the financial crisis uh, crashed into each other. Um, and that was a really big part of the ongoing presidential election in, in September and October and uh, November of 2008. But at the beginning, when I was covering it, it was just the housing crisis. Yeah. And, and it must have been so interesting, but terrible at the same time and heartbreaking seeing this coming to a head. Uh, do, do you think that's some of the reasons why states, you know, like your your North Carolinas, if, I, if I'm right in saying that, or, or Virginia, who hadn't went Democrat before, went Democrat, yeah. you know, they've they seen how tightly they were being squeezed and thought, you know what, we really need to change. Yeah, I mean, I think the U.S. in general was looking for something different in 2008. I, I always go back to how many Republicans I knew who voted for Obama in 2008 and then didn't vote for him in 2012 um, or voted for Trump in 2016. But North Carolina and Virginia are really good examples of states that had begun to change. They had long been sort of bastions of the Confederacy, the sort of white, um, uh, you know, Confederate type history states. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, you had this tech boom. You had a diversifying population in Virginia, North Carolina, even Florida to, to an extent as well. And Colorado was another one of those where you saw this diversification of the population, but also the professionalism. You had a lot of people who were graduating from college, working for AOL in Virginia or some of these biotech companies in, in North Carolina. And, you know, they didn't want politics as usual. And a big part of that was the, the war in Iraq. You know, Obama was firmly against that. McCain was firmly for it. You know, the interesting thing is everybody thought because Obama was for getting out of Iraq, that meant he wanted to get out of Afghanistan too. And it, yeah. it, the opposite happened, right? Like he ended up sending thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops to Afghanistan during his presidency and got out of Iraq. Um, but yeah, you had this huge change in these, in these Southern uh, states like North Carolina and Virginia that were itching for something different. And then when the financial crisis hit, got hit really hard by a lot of these mortgages and um, you know, the housing crisis. What was the, the atmosphere like in, in Washington when Obama was elected? It was crazy. I mean, I, I I think even people who didn't vote for him got caught up in the history of the moment. Um, yeah. it, it was just sort of fascinating to see people crying. I, I, I guess that was something that happened in the 60s, you know, with Kennedy and stuff like that. Sure. But certainly in the 80s, nobody was crying because <laughs> Reagan was elected, even if you're the biggest supporter. And nobody was crying because Bill Clinton was elected, right? I mean, people were happy if, you know, if you were a Reagan supporter or a Bush supporter or, or Clinton or Bush, right? But nobody was crying. And I, I, again, I remember talking to Republicans who were sort of in awe of the moment. And you had people filling up the squares in every downtown, you know, out there cheering for them. And other than the most partisan of Republicans, I think the majority of the country were sort of in awe that 
the, the country, the United States, with its own history of slavery and racial oppression and things like that, could elect a black man president. And I think that was, you know, it changed our country fundamentally, but it also proved that the country could change in positive ways, too. And I think a lot of people really saw that. I think what's quite interesting about that and the parallels to not to dive too much into current U.S. politics, but the parallels to Trump as well is that when we are watching television here in the in the UK or in Scotland, we often see, you know, those who you would class as the, the minority groups, the, the fringe groups who were very anti-Obama, you know, they never wanted a black man in, uh, in the White House. When we're looking at Trump, you know, you're seeing a, a lot of very, very right-wing Confederate Republicans who are voting for Trump. The reality yeah. is, and this is what we probably don't see, most people are in the middle. Yeah, generally. I mean, uh, there's a couple of things you have to remember about American politics, which is that Democrats, in terms of the vote totals, won 2008, 2012, 2016, and 2020. And they also won the vote total in 2000 as well. The only year that Democrats have lost the total vote total was 2004. Or 2004. So the country, in terms of voters, overwhelmingly in the last 20 years has supported Democratic presidential candidates. Now, because we have a little bit of a funny system with the Electoral College in 2000 and in 2016, that meant uh, that Republicans were still able to win by razor thin margins in Florida and Wisconsin and some other places. But yeah, I mean, the country is overwhelmingly uh, in the middle on a lot of issues and personal style means a lot. Um, You know, Obama had a style and Bush had a style uh, that you know, I think appeal to a lot of people, even if they didn't fully agree with them. Trump, in a lot of ways, is an aberration. It is an outlier in terms of all things uh, presidential history, and it should be studied as an outlier. Uh, you know, he yeah. he never had the support in America that people had said he did uh, in terms of you look at votes. You look at the off year elections. I mean, his record is essentially one election in 2016 that he won on a statistical aberration. Um, now he won on take that nothing away from him but um it, it, it's hard to see how that is a repeatable victory for somebody like trump or even the republican party uh going forward and things like that because a lot largely the country is in the middle and both parties have to tack better towards the middle and, and, and frankly democrats have done a better job in presidential elections of doing that in the last 20 years than the republicans have i think uh, what, what you said there's a, a very poignant point is that you know, people want to see a personality. You know, they're, they're looking for char- uh, charisma there. They're looking for a certain type of person. And just on a personal note, that's probably one of the things that I, I hate most about politics. But I get it. You yeah. know, people people aren't necessarily drilling down on what are you going to do for the economy? What are you going to do for jobs? What are you going to do for the climate emergency? It's, it's very much, what is this person's personality? And and I, I feel, you know, America and, and the UK to a certain extent has really caught get caught up in this phenomenon. And it's like, ah, you, you need to see past that. Yeah, I think you want people who are likable. I mean, I think history has always shown in democratic elections that overwhelmingly voters vote for people they like, first yeah. and foremost. It doesn't have to be, do I want to have a beer with this person, right? Like, I mean, that's that's sort of the old Absolutely. silly thing. But like, generally, they want to have people in power who represent them, right? I mean, or at least if they don't look like them or talk like them, at least make voters feel like there is a sense of, yeah, we're all in this together. It doesn't always happen. I mean, I don't think um, every political prime minister or president who's ever been elected in you know Western democratic countries or even non-Western democratic countries represents everybody, but I, I, that's a big part of it. And I think that, you know, from what I'm taking from you, and I think somebody who's covered politics, you also want to see a political competency you know, yeah. a policy competency. Do you understand what's happening in the country? And do you understand that if you do this, this might happen? Or if you don't do this, this might happen. And I think that's what's lost on a lot of politicians is that that policy competency is not something that we generally elect always in in, in a lot of Western countries. Absolutely. And especially in America, when you've got, you know, two main parties buying for it, it's, it seems from the outside looking in that, you know, there's there's got to be more there if you scratch beneath, beneath the surface. Both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are they're very broad bases. You know, there, there's so many people that make up these organisations that yeah. How do you get a true representation of all of them? And I suppose that's when when you 
drill down, it's probably based on the area where people are electing from. Yeah, I, yeah. Some of it is national trends. I mean, like you can never discount the role of the economy in the election, right? I mean, people vote with their pocketbooks. Do they feel like they are in a better place? But people also vote with, what does this person say about me and what it, my country and my community? And, um, you know, I think 2016, the fact that Trump did as well as he did in the Republican Party, he said that the Republican Party hadn't actually been representing a lot of the views of their own vo- voters. I mean, a lot of Republicans, and particularly ones who voted for Trump in the primary or even the general election, you know, they were angry. They, they felt like they were losing their country. And a lot of that had to do poll after poll, study after study shows that there's a lot of Republicans who feel like the, the history of the country that they knew and understand, which is largely sort of the, uh, the white history, the Protestant history is being taken from them as more and more uh, immigrants come to America and it becomes a more diverse society. And that is a trend we're seeing more and more in the Republican Party. I don't know if every Republican going forward is going to get elected on that platform, on that sort of Trumpian platform. We're not seeing that necessarily. Um, but there's a large part of the Republican Party and of America um, that feel that way right now. Let's touch on uh, those conflict zones that you went to. You know, we, we mentioned that you were out in Iraq. You, you were also in Afghanistan. Uh, I believe you've been to Kabul, Jerusalem, all over the place. What, what, what do your family think when you say to them, oh, listen, I'm just going to Afghanistan for a few months or a year? So when I, when I moved to Afghanistan, I think my parents at that point were sort of used to me making some of these decisions that they, I don't want to say rolled their eyes up, but they're like, oh, what? Um, I, I had, had a job in, huh? What, what age were you? Oh, how old was I? So yeah. it was 2009. So I was like, 32, I guess. Um, I, I had quit my job in the tech world. I had been in technology, uh, um, in sales and and sort of work in the tech world, um, after graduate school. And I quit that job in 2006 to go into journalism. And I went from, you know, a nice salary, uh, in Washington, DC to making $17,000 a year, you know, in Yakima, Washington. Um, because I wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to get into journalism. And I went all the way across the country uh, to a very small, poorly sort of um, educated, very poor infrastructure type community in Yakima. And so I think my parents were slightly used to that at that point. Um, I'd make other decisions. But I remember telling them when I got the job offer from Fox, uh, I said, I have good news and bad news. (laughs) And they said, well, what is it? And I said, well, the good news is I have a job. And uh, the bad news is, and my parents are not particularly Fox viewers, uh, I said it's with Fox News. And my dad's first uh, response was, are they at least going to give you body armor and someplace safe to live? And I said, yes. And he goes, all right, well, then I, I, we'll, we'll deal with Fox News, um, <laughs> you know, as a place for you to work. And so they were sort of happy that I was going to at least have the infrastructure around me of a professional news organization uh, to make sure, you know, I, I, I had some security and some of the, you know, body armor things that you needed for a place like Kabul. So what happens when you first touch down? What, what are you thinking when you first get there? You must have been shitting yourself slightly. Yeah, a little bit. You know, I, I it was more concerned. I landed and I only knew one person in Kabul and it was a friend of a friend of a friend. I mean, it was not somebody I knew. And when you land in, in Afghanistan at the airport in Kabul, particularly in 2009, um, you land at the airport, you don't just walk out and hail a taxi, right? Like they don't allow taxis because of suicide bombers anywhere near the airport. So you walk out and you're like, okay, I'm in this huge airport. I don't know where I'm going. I don't read any of the signs. Nobody's there to pick me up. And I didn't have a local phone. I didn't have a way of reaching the person who was supposed to pick me up. And so I had to borrow somebody's phone, an Afghan person, um, and say, hey, can I borrow your phone? Because I need to call the one person I know. But like, it takes you a few minutes to sort of get up the like, can I go up to a random stranger in another country who I don't know if they speak English and borrow their phone? Um, you know, fortunately, Afghans are very pleasant, nice people. And, and I, I found somebody who spoke English and they immediately gave me their phone. You know, I made a two quick two minute call. I was able to find somebody. But yeah, it was uh, the landing there was kind of like, wow. But I had booked three nights in a hotel uh, where a lot of journalists stayed in Kabul called the Gandamak. And it had actually been an old house that Osama bin Laden had lived in years ago. And it was sort of a famous restaurant 
hotel slash bar for all journalists. I mean, I, you know, the number of like BBC and Sky News journalists I met there was pretty legendary, but I had booked a, a room there for three nights. And then I was going to have to go find uh, accommodations. At this point, I didn't have a job. I was just there on my own dime. And um, so I hold immediately on. You, found... You, you went there before you had the job with Fox? Yeah. yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> I moved there as a freelancer. Um, oh, my goodness. And I moved into an Afghan guest house that basically they didn't speak English, but they had internet and they gave me, um, was it breakfast every morning? I think, I think I $400 a week got me internet, a place to sleep and, um, breakfast every morning of, of, of like bread and eggs or something like that. I look back at it now and I, I, I'm like, I don't know what I was doing. You know, it was pre-kids, pre-marriage and pre-smarts, I guess, you know, there's just <laughs> a lot of stupidity and, um, what I've told everyone is like, I would never tell anyone to go do something like that. But I also would tell you that it is possible to do. There were a lot of other journalists who just moved to war zones, conflict areas and made a name for themselves. Um, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it. And do you think that, you know, news stations like Fox, like CNN, you know, all the all the top outlets in the US, they're probably looking at someone that has done that like yourself and thinking, well, this guy's got something about him. You know, he's taken the initiative to go there and get news yeah. get stories you know that that's the type of person they want on board surely yeah definitely i mean I, some of our most famous people in journalism in the united states have done similar things anderson cooper is a cnn anchor he he literally went to i think it was bosnia and sarajevo um in the 90s during the wars there and you know brought a camera and started doing stories on his own um there's uh, the the host of morning edition which is our npr affiliate um our station here in the united states is a woman named rachel martin she went to Afghanistan on her own in like 2004 or five. So like, this is something that there is a long history of American journalists, but I'm sure British journalists as well. Um, you know, that you just go somewhere and you say, all right, I'm going to find a job. And I think that's something that happens a lot, but I, I do think like, if you're a manager, first of all, the person's there already. So they're a great hire, right? You don't have to yeah. fly anyone in there. And so location, totally. location, location, like it's, a, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Um, but I do think, Every news organization wants somebody who has the sort of courage to say, yeah, I'm just going to go do it. Because when you got to knock on doors or you got to approach people for interviews, like part of it is just, are you willing to go do it? And then that makes a big difference between somebody who is going to have a career in journalism and somebody who isn't, which is, do you have that gumption to sort of just go do it? Um, and I think that was a, I think it was both something that was part of my personality but i also think it was something that i learned to do time and time and time again uh i read online and i've, I've read some of the, the stories that you, that you put out at the time as well and it looks like there was times where you spent you know staying with american military forces afghan military forces can you tell us a bit about that you know what, what was the experience like and i suppose what what did you see on the ground was there there must be things that will haunt you for life and and other things that you know i suppose they're probably quite heartwarming at times as well to yeah, I mean, Afghanistan is such a unique conflict. Um, but I, I should also say my wife is Afghan-American. I met her there. She was a oh, journalist as well, or is a journalist as well. So, like, I, I have a connection to Afghanistan today that I didn't have when I first went there, right? Um, sure. I, I didn't really know much about Afghanistan other than every journalist I ever met who had been there had wonderful things to say about the, the culture people. and the people of yeah. Afghanistan. Um both the good and the bad things about it. I mean, they, you know, it's sort of, they, they welcome it. It, it. Afghanistan, I was there from 2009 to 2013 living there. And so I was there at the height of what was the Obama surge. Um, I spent a lot of time with U.S. troops and British troops. Um, I was in Helmand, uh, Kandahar, Patia, um, you know, just all over the country. Covered several elections is there as well. You know, I, I think looking back now, I would say, the country was moving in the right direction before August of 2021, um, before, you know, all troops were pulled out. It was moving very slowly. Uh, it, it had a lot of problems and a lot of those problems were Western made problems. We, we dumped way too much money in there for a lot of years, just thinking that we could buy good behavior, good democratic behavior, good governance, things like that. And we bought a lot of warlords support thinking that they wanted the same things as we did as the Western world. And unfortunately, um, we sort of built in a system of corruption that was 
in, ingrained in Afghan society during the 20 years that the West was there. I think some of it was being improved with technology. There was some progress. There were, there were things like, how do you pay government officials to make sure that they're real government officials? Well, up until like 2019, we just literally handed people money. And so there was all sorts of corruption. They were starting to um, do electronic payment to people. Um, so they only registered human beings who actually were alive in Afghanistan working for an Afghan ministry were getting paid. Was that going to solve everything? No, of course not. But like that was a that was a step forward in Afghanistan that um, you know the country like that needed. Uh, but ultimately, you also just had too many people who were making too much money on the Taliban side, on the U.S. supported warlord side, where war was good business, and we kept pumping money in there. We kept pumping weapons and and guns and things like that, and. I'm not sure they would have ever fully turned the corner, but the war was good business for a lot of American contractors and for a lot of the international community. And that's a really tough thing to to end. But it also meant like thousands upon thousands of people were killed there. How do you go about meeting your future wife in a conflict zone? So she was actually the CNN correspondent, um, oh, which is how I met her. She was part of the small sort of uh, journalist community. Um, so I was at Fox. She was at CNN. Um, that's an unlikely we actually story, sh- isn't it? Yeah, we actually <laughs> shared the same security company. And this is one of the things that people never really know is journalism is very cutthroat domestically, whether it's in the United States or like London or in the UK or wherever. Um, you know, people don't cooperate. People, everyone wants their own story. Internationally, you almost have to work together because you don't want to see a colleague go down a road where, you know, there's a Taliban checkpoint and then all of a sudden they don't come back, right? So like, we share information, we share security companies and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I, like some of my closest friends are Sky News reporters or BBC reporters um, or journalists from other news outlets who would be competing against you on a story, but you would also, you know, have dinner with at night and, you know, you might share information about like, what's going on over here? Is it safe? Like, can I go there and things like that? And, you know, my wife, Atia was with CNN, but like, we shared the same security company. Fox and CNN used the same security company um, to guide us and things like that. And then uh, she actually jumped over to NBC and I stay with Fox. And now I'm actually generally, I freelance with CNN and she's back with NBC as an analyst. So uh, we sort of, you know, moved around in, in media, which happens a lot in our business. Sure. That's, I, I suppose it's a, a good ending to what was probably a, a traumatic, but also big learning curve as well, you know? Yeah, I mean, I I have two small kids and we're happy here in the United States. And, um, you know, I obviously have a great uh, family and relationship that I got out of Kabul. We always joke that Iraq was the war that seemed to have ended a lot of marriages for journalists and diplomats and people. And Kabul and Afghanistan seem to be uh, where a lot of people got married. And we have so many friends who are journalists, who are diplomats, even some military people who met their significant other in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and it's one of those things that you sort of laugh at and you think, okay, a lot of divorces happened coming out of Iraq, um, but a lot a lot of weddings and marriages happened coming out of Afghanistan. That's fascinating. Do, do you go back often? I haven't been back since 2017, um, but I uh, we, we're looking to trying to go back at some point for some projects that we're pitching. Sure. And you're, you're based in California now, is that right, L.A.? Yeah, in Los Angeles. Yep. Brilliant. I think what would be nice to touch on now is, you know, what you've been up to recently. Uh, it, it seems like you've been been fairly busy. And, and as I mentioned at the, the start of the show, you know, you've you've got a very exciting podcast launched last week. Yeah, I, I came back to the US and have been doing various media projects. Um, one of the ones that sort of caught my eye was in 2020, um, a, a friend of mine who I'd worked on another political podcast called Long Shots, which was about presidential losers in America who still impacted our systems. People like Ross Perot and Jesse Jackson, the first woman who ran for the presidency in 1872 before women even had the right to vote, Victoria Woodhull. And my partner, Gary Scott, and I were looking for the next project. And we got a text message uh, about a guy named Hernan Lopez, who was a Fox Sports executive and ran a podcast company called Wondery which is one of the larger podcasts uh, here in the United States. And he, in 2020, got indicted as part of the 2015 FIFA corruption case. And my partner, Gary, and I were like, 
wait, they're still arresting people. They're still charging people five years later. And he, he said, what do you think about doing this as a podcast? And I immediately Google FIFA corruption. And I just found article after article after article of <laughs> stories about FIFA. And it wasn't just 2015. It went back to, you know, it's support for right wing dictators in Argentina in 1978. It went back to how they really screwed Brazil in 2014 with the demands for these new stadiums. Um, it went back to Stanley Rouse, who was the FIFA president in the 1960s and his support for South Africa. And, and all immediately, my partner and I were like, well, there's a lot of here, material here. Like there's a great podcast. Here. And um, so we, have, we started working on Lords of Soccer uh, in 2020. And we really wanted to sort of chart the history of FIFA. And, and there's some great journalists who have done some great work, Andrew Jennings, uh, who's probably the most famous, uh, you know, a fellow Scott who uh, has done incredible work about exposing FIFA's corruption. But nobody had sort of put it all together, and certainly not in a podcast form. Yeah. I think it's particularly relevant because as a soccer football fan, we should be watching the World Cup right now. Yeah. Right? We should be enjoying the World Cup right now, but because of FIFA's own corruption and a lot of vote buying and a lot of bribery, this year's World Cup has been postponed into November so that a country with no soccer stadiums, no soccer pedigree um, of only a couple million people, Qatar, so that they could have this World Cup. And it's a joke. I mean, we've had a World Cup for 92 years in the summer since 1930. And this year, we're going to have to wait until November when our own domestic leagues should be playing their games, our own other sports to be in the middle of their seasons, whether it's American football and things like that. And, you know, FIFA's corruption has really screwed viewers and fans of the World Cup. It's outrageous, you know, and being a, a big Scottish football fan myself, you know, I don't want to see the season stop in November, December. No, to, nobody to, does. No, you know, to, to watch a World Cup that, you know, Scotland won't, probably won't be in, uh, you know, that it shouldn't be happening where it's happening, where, you know, thousands of people have died making this happen, you know. I, I just, the, the list is endless, Connor, and, and you're probably the, the wrong person to tell this to because you you know it inside out. But how do you go about making a podcast about that? Because it, it is something like, where do I start? You know, I, the, the list is endless of FIFA corruption. And uh, in your first episode, you, you touched on a, a guy called Chuck Blazer, who uh, I think many will recognise if they've seen a photo of them, but maybe don't know a great deal about him. And, you know, Chuck's an American man as well, so... It was probably quite a, an interesting one for you, you knowing like this is the only American really involved with FIFA at the start. Uh, yeah. And oh my goodness, the corruption is off the scale. Yeah, I think w the first question that people sort of always ask about Chuck Blazer and also FIFA is like, why was it the Americans who were the ones who launched this investigation, right? And who essentially brought down FIFA at the start. And there's two really good reasons. Well, three really good reasons. And the, the first is after 9-11, every wire transfer essentially went through the United States because of the way that the, the, the payment systems work. We have the largest financial system. So everything goes through U.S. jurisdiction banks in the United States. And after 9-11, we changed the laws that basically the federal government gets to review all of these transactions. So immediately, anytime that there's an illegal payment, a dodgy payment from FIFA to somebody else, they were often doing it, not just in envelopes full of cash, but also a lot of times wire transfers. And then, so that gave the U.S. jurisdiction. And also because while soccer is important in the United States and we enjoy the World Cup and it gets great ratings, it isn't our religion, right? Like, I mean, around the rest of the world, soccer really is a religion. And so prosecutors, politicians who might want to tackle FIFA corruption in the past in other countries would never dare do it because FIFA would essentially retaliate against politicians, against national teams. And nobody in America was like, well, we're really going to screw the American national team for our World Cup chances if we go out against FIFA, right? So we had we didn't have the political interference that, say, a European country, a South American team, or any uh, country uh, might have. And then the final reason goes to Chuck Blazer, which is there was one American on FIFA, he was totally corrupt, and he never paid his taxes. And so after the 2010 vote that gave Qatar and Russia the World Cup, and then after some other uh, dodgy things that had to do with Sepp Blatter's election in 2011, an FBI agent and an IRS agent 
basically started looking at Chuck Blazer. And an IRS agent by the name of Steve Berryman here in California, who's a soccer fan, loved the World Cup, played in college. He literally went into the IRS system and said, Chuck Blazer. And came up, hasn't paid taxes since the early 80s. And he immediately called these FBI agents who were doing an investigation, but had gone nowhere into, fo- into FIFA and said, um, you know, this guy, Chuck Blazer, who's the American on FIFA, he's never paid taxes. You can probably get him on a, a tax case and he'll you know, spill the beans, basically. And that's what happened was in November of 2011, Steve Berryman and an FBI agent um, went to Chuck Blazer and literally said, outside of his two Trump Tower apartments in New York, said, we know you haven't paid taxes. We know you're involved in dodginess at FIFA. You are either going to cooperate or you're going to go to jail. And Chuck Blazer turned to them and said, yeah, I'll wear a wire. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, and he described himself as a fat crook from Brooklyn. And he kind of always knew that this day was going to come. And that's where we start the story about FIFA corruption. But what I'll, I'll tell you is that that corruption is just a little tentacle because then that 2015 case spirals into so much more. And that's the first four episodes of the podcast. And then we go back in history. It's, it's fascinating. And I think that's really, really interesting what you say about America and how they never, you know, Americans, as much as they love soccer, love sport more than anything else, they they never had any hesitation in bringing this guy down. And I get exactly what you mean about European countries and South American countries potentially maybe holding back in that. But I suppose on a bigger scale, it makes me wonder how someone who, as you says, has been staying in a two-story apartment in Trump Tower and hasn't paid tax since the 1980s, hasn't been held to account before that. You know, I don't want to give too much away about the, the podcast Serious, uh, as I says, I think before we started recording, I've only listened to episode one and I was fascinated with it. You know, for those that want to check this out, it isn't just a, a football or a soccer podcast. You know, it's got everything. Uh, it's more a true crime podcast, I would say, Connor. But, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I if you are solely a fan of soccer, we don't even talk about games, really. I mean, we talk about a couple matches when it comes to the 1973 Chilean versus Soviet Union match. Um which was a farce. It didn't even include any Soviet Union players. It was 11 Chileans on the, on the field and FIFA still let it go on. Uh, that's for a later discussion. Uh, so we talk about some matches like that, but in terms of like the sport, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about it. This is a crime podcast. This is a hold people to account, hold people in power um, to account podcast. And I think as somebody like myself who loves sports, who loves the World Cup, uh, you know, I, I think there's so much money in the game in sports in general that they don't have to be corrupt entities in order to have a great World Cup. I think that's one of the things that blows my mind is to fast forward a little bit. You know, FIFA has had to, um, well, it, one of the ironies of the U.S. prosecution of FIFA is that they've collected about $200 million worth of money stolen from individuals. And they're actually giving it back to FIFA because FIFA, the organization, even though it was corrupt FIFA uh, members who were doing the bribes and and taking the money, FIFA is actually the abused entity. So the U.S. Department of Justice has clawed back about $200 million worth of money, and it's all going back to FIFA. And, And the point I've always made about the corruption within FIFA is that there was so much money within the FIFA environment, the atmosphere, the landscape that these guys could have paid themselves $10 million a year on the up and up, been rolling in money and not have had to pay any bribes. There was so much money sloshing around in the system. But unfortunately, after Zhao Havelange, who was the uh, FIFA president from 74 until I think uh, 98, uh, and then with Sepp Blatter, who was his right-hand man and then became president, these guys were crooks. These guys were all criminals. And so doing things on the up and up making money on the up and up, it never really occurred to them because it just wasn't in their nature. They, 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 they never thought about going legit because it was almost, why would we, this is too much fun. Like let's, yeah. let's pay people, you know, envelopes full of $40,000 for votes. You, you made reference in the podcast or there, there was reference in the podcast to, you know, those that were running FIFA at the time, you know, like your set blatters, like your blazers to being like a mob 
you know, you, you says, if you look after the family, the family look after you. And yep. the, the more that you dig into these people that were involved in that, it seems like, you know, such a great comparison. Uh, and I'm not the one who described them as a criminal element, right? If you go back and look at what um, Jim Comey, who is the FBI director, and Loretta Lynch, who is the attorney general, on the day they brought the charges in, in May of 2015, they describe FIFA as a criminal organization. And they basically said it ticks all the boxes of a criminal conspiracy. It's over multiple years. In FIFA's case, it was over multiple decades. It involved multiple people in multiple countries, and it involved multiple schemes and multiple, essentially, criminal plots. And so if you look at what the definition of a criminal organization is, it ticks all the boxes. And if you go to the, the Mob Museum, which is in Las Vegas, Nevada, which has a, you know, uh, a history of all the sort of world's greatest mobsters, criminals, and cartel leaders, there's a section in the mob museum for FIFA. No way. And they, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really? yeah and, and in fact, it actually, they have a great interview with um, uh, Andrew Jennings. You know, again, I think I, I have to say wonderful things about Andrew Jennings um, because I think he's one of a lot of great journalists who broke this stuff. And I think what we did is to try to collate and put all this stuff together um, and to try to talk to people in their own voices, uh, some of these whistleblowers like Bonita Merciades, who, who was an Australian soccer executive who really blew the whistle on FIFA. Um, but the guy who started all of this, the guy who basically said, I am going to bring down FIFA, was Andrew Jennings. And so the Mob Museum in Las Vegas has an incredible interview with him where he talks about these guys. And in his last interview he did before he died. Uh, you know, he just he described Zhao Havalans and Sepp Blatter as crooks and criminals. And, and that's what they were. Um, it's not just us using that in hyperbole. That's literally the way the professional investigators from the U.S. Department of Justice, from uh, Switzerland, from uh, Lord Treisman and some of these other guys who dealt with FIFA. It's the way they describe these guys. It's interesting that you mentioned, Andrew, and the, the work that he's done is amazing and your line of work, Connor. Do you feel like people like Andrew, and maybe less so yourself, but and and you know the, the stories that you've been putting out there. Do you ever feel a, a bit of a fear that you know if, if you are exposing people who are subject to criminality and on a very large scale that it might come back to bite you? Um, you know, I asked a lot of people when I started sniffing around FIFA um, about how they reacted, and, and I, again, I. I never got a chance to talk to Andrew before he died. Uh, I reached out to him. He was not in good health. I talked to a lot of other people who worked with him and who did this type of work. Um, there's a guy in Germany, um, Jan Weinreich, I think is his name. And I talked to him sort of off the record. And, and just what, what everyone told me was back in the day under Sepp Blatter, FIFA loved to send ceased and desist uh, papers to people. You know, we're going to sue you. Don't do this. But because FIFA never actually wanted to go to court and to face any type of uh, evidence investigation, right? Like if you're suing somebody, you've got to turn over your own evidence. You've got to go through the court process. So FIFA used to threaten people all the time. They would block people. They you know, wouldn't cooperate. And so people like Andrew Jennings got a lot of harassment, but they never sent they never sent goons as far as i can tell to sort of attack people like andrew jennings or some of david corn and some of these others who did great work um in large part because these guys were they weren't quite mobsters they were crooks and criminals but they're very much white collar right like you know set bladder wore some of the finest suits jao havalange wore fine suits chuck blazer who was 400 pounds a beard and hair as bushy and white as santa claus wore ten thousand dollar suits these guys all love their fancy suits and they weren't really into the, let's send somebody to go rough somebody up. That was almost a bridge too far um, because they still wanted to be accepted in polite company. They wanted to be able to dine in the fancy restaurants and, you know, in London or Zurich and Paris. So I, I was never particularly concerned. I haven't heard anything from FIFA. I reached out to this FIFA for an official interview. They never responded. Um, I think these guys, these guys don't really have to worry about it in all honesty in terms of like roughing people up. Um, but one of the, the sort of follow on to that is like, has FIFA changed? No, I mean, Gianni Infantino is under investigation. Sepp Blatter 
is on trial right now. Michelle Platini is on trial right now. There are a whole host of other people who are under investigation. More than 50 people stemming from that 2015 investigation have been charged uh, and convicted and stuff. So I don't think FIFA has changed dramatically. I do think they're a little more sophisticated. I think they have a lot of lawyers that are telling them, do this, don't do that. And so they haven't harassed me. And I don't think they're really in the business of harassing people at this point because it would only become another news story. Yeah. And and you touched on, you know, that there's many on trial at the moment. It, it seems to me from the outside looking in, and you have more knowledge in this than, than I do, it just seems like they're always going to get away with it. And I suppose Chuck Blazer, to a, a certain extent, is is a great example of that, you know, he, he pled guilty to charges that, you know, it was wire fraud, tax evasion, money laundering, et cetera. And then he passes away. He dies before yeah. he has to go to trial. And you're like, these people yeah. just never see justice. Yeah, I mean, Sepp Ladder and Michelle Platini and some of these other guys, um, you know, I, I don't think they're going to see a day in jail. Uh, you know, they've lost a lot of money. And I think that what hurts them more than anything is what we were just talking about. Is like they're not welcomed in high society anymore. I mean, one of the things you have to understand about FIFA and the guys who are on the executive committee is they flew private jets everywhere. They ate in the best restaurants. They they had private events with the biggest stars in the world, musicians and things like that. I mean, they were, if, if in most countries, if a FIFA executive came to town, either the president or prime minister would meet them. Yeah. These guys were at the elite of society. That's been ripped away from them. Right. Yeah. Like that is not what they're able to do anymore. And I think for somebody like Sepp Blatter, who, you know, he's near the end of his life. He's like 86 years old. He's not in great health. I, I think in some ways, just not being the president of FIFA and being welcomed everywhere in the world is probably a huge um, punishment to him. That said, you know, there probably should be jail time for a lot of these guys, uh, but that that hasn't happened. I'm not sure it will happen. There have been some that have gone to jail. There are some that, you know, they can't travel. They've had property seized. Uh, um, Jose, uh, Jose Avila, who ran sort of the Brazilian TV marketing rights for FIFA in South America, um, I think he had to forfeit like $150 million. We get into that here in the, in the next couple episodes. You know, that's a pretty stiff penalty. He was looking to retire in 2010 or so, and he wanted to get out of the business. Uh, he wanted to, he was not, he actually got arrested when he was in the United States because he was buying property in Florida to retire. And that money was ripped away from him. So there have been some punishments, but yeah, these guys are not going to go to jail. I mean, the criminal systems around the world don't treat white collar crime the same as they treat other types of crimes. Um, but I do think, particularly for somebody like Sepp Blatter, the fact that he isn't Sepp and he isn't welcomed as the the mayor of soccer around the world, I do think that's a huge punishment for him. Yeah, you, you take that status away from them and it's almost like removing their identity, isn't it? That's Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And then, I mean, Gianni Infantino at the 2018 Women's World Cup was booed mercilessly uh, as he was giving out the trophy to the United States. And... You know, my guess is he went back to his fancy hotel and flew on his private jet and was perfectly fine. But, you know, I think after a while that does start to take a toll on some of these guys. And, and I think we're still probably several years away before the entire FIFA system is flushed out. But I do think a lot of the worst actors have been removed from FIFA. But I'll tell you what's coming up in the soccer community that isn't talked about is, and we didn't include this in Lords of Soccer because um, it just couldn't get to it in the 12 episodes. But there is a huge problem with match fixing right now. And it's incredibly problematic in Asia. And it's becoming problematic in Africa. Because while FIFA is flowing in money, there's a lot of players who aren't. And there's a lot of referees who aren't. And so it's really easy to fix matches right now. And there's a guy named uh, Declan Hill who wrote a whole book about spending time with match fixers in, in Asia and the money that's sloshing around doesn't always make it to the players at the lower levels in some of these other countries. And there's just a lot of guy, a lot of dodgy guys hanging around soccer stadiums in Africa and Asia and probably here in the U S too. Um, you know, I don't think it's as prevalent in Europe because your players are on so much money 
um, in the, in, you know, Bundesliga or, you know, La Liga and, and the British Premier and stuff like that. But in Africa and Asia, where these guys aren't on a ton of money, it, it is definitely a problem for the global soccer community. How do we stop that, Connor? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I think you got to have question, isn't it? There's, there's soccer officials. Yeah. yeah, I think you got to have soccer officials who are on the up and up. Um, and I think that's while FIFA, the executive committee, is probably better than it's ever been. I don't think some of these regional soccer uh, committees are probably as clean as they need to be. And they probably look the other way. They probably are. There's some of these guys who are getting cuts of money and stuff like that. I mean, a lot like Chuck Blazer and Jack Warner were right. Like sure. Chuck Blazer was known as Mr. 10% because he got 10% of every marketing deal uh, that CONCACAF signed. Um, you know, that takes a lot of money out of CONCACAF's budget with 10% of everything. Um, and I think you probably, I'd be willing to bet that there are probably people who don't have formal contracts in, in Africa and Asia, in Latin America, but who are probably getting a cut out of every deal that Kome Ball or, um, you know, some of these other uh, FIFA federations are, you know, the marketing deals, deals they're signing. So I, I don't know how you get it out. I think you just got to keep trying to have prosecutors and governments, pro, you know, investigate this stuff. And, and hopefully now that FIFA isn't sort of running cover for these people in the way Seth Ladder did. Hopefully there is more room to investigate these guys at the lower level. Uh, it's, yeah, the title of the podcast, you know, it, it couldn't be more perfect, you know, how FIFA stole the beautiful game, because when you talk about these stories, there's absolutely nothing beautiful about it. Uh, no, well, not at all. You, you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the Women's World Cup final there and, and uh, the US winning it, of course. And I think, you know, the, the US women's team are really inspirational you know they've, they've done so much to put equality on the map and uh, really raise the profile of, of women's football all across the globe am i right in saying that in in the upcoming episodes you, you touch quite a bit on you know sexism in football yeah we do a whole episode i think it's episode 11 about the women's world cup which was actually not known the first women's world cup was in 1991 and the u.s won it in china and it was not actually known as a FIFA World Cup. It was known as the Women's World Championship sponsored by Mars, I think, something like that. Like the, the, the Mars sponsorship was in the official name of the championship trophy. And um, they were playing for the Mars Cup as well. We weren't even playing for a FIFA trophy. I and mean, it was like Mars, the candy bar maker, was everything. And that was because Sepp Blatter, Jao Havelans, the FIFA guys didn't want, they didn't really trust that women's soccer could be a thing. And so they didn't want to attach the FIFA label to it. And they gave it to China in 1991 because China at that time was sort of starting to open up. They wanted to host a Olympics. And, but the world community didn't really trust communist China to host an event. And China basically said to FIFA, we'll pay for everything. Don't worry about it. We'll fill the stands. You won't have any empty stadiums. But they literally bust in workers from factories. And it was an incredible environment. They had a great World Cup. Um, but FIFA basically didn't want to roll the dice promoting a World Cup for women because they didn't believe in women's soccer. But China came along and said, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for everything. And they did. And the women who won uh, for the U.S. team only got like $400, $500, something like that. Like it was a joke. It rages, um, and most of them didn't even get the money because a lot of them were college soccer players and stuff like that. And, you know, it, it wasn't just the United States um, in the – was it the 2000? I don't know. I think it was the 1995 World Cup. Um, and I think it, uh, it was Norway that won the, 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 the championship, which at that time became uh, a World Cup, FIFA Women's World Cup. I actually got the title. Um, one of the most famous players on the Norwegian team, she was known as the Magnum PI of soccer because her real job was as a private investigator. No way. And they only got $10,000 for women winning the Women's World Cup. Um, and we really chart in this episode the history of the Women's World Cup. We talked to Michelle Akers, who's probably the most famous women's player ever. She and Pele were, you know, the two most important soccer players of the 20th century. And she tells us about her story. She tells us about, like, demanding that the U.S. national team give them uniforms, give them shoes. Um, and if you think about what's going on in the mid 1990s, this is when Chuck Blazer and Jack Warner are stealing money from 
CONCACAF. And there's when all these dodgy deals are going on and the U S national team can't even give the women's national side Shots. uniforms and shoes and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So that corruption that was happening under Jack Warner and Chuck Blazer and Sepp Blatter's watch, and Joe Havalanche's watch that was taking money out of the game that impacted women's players, not only in the United States, but around the world. And, you know, there are a whole host of issues that, uh, women's players still face today, whether it's sexism and uh, equal pay, just even safety. Um, you know, there's there's some big stories about uh, a Mexican woman who was working for FIFA in Qatar on the w- World Cup staff who was raped. And FIFA didn't do anything. They couldn't care less. And so like these these issues are still there, unfortunately, within global soccer but within the apparatus that is fifa and connor that should be a global story and excuse my ignorance but i hadn't even heard that you know that that in itself is an absolute scandal yeah i'll send you the article i mean it was covered in like the daily mail and the sun and so it's sort of the tabloids and stuff sure. like that and, and again with anything there is a he said she said type of uh, narrative but yeah. um i don't I, I think we're at the point now where like you, you believe the women until somebody comes up with definitive proof that says that they're full of shit, right? Um, apologies for, for cursing, but like it was covered, but, but it's, it's a lot like the deaths in Qatar. Like there's just a whole lot of people overlooking what's going on in Qatar um, and what FIFA's doing there. And that all stems from the culture of corruption that was built over decades within FIFA. It, it, it almost begs the question a lot of the time is, why do we keep going back? You know what? Why are people still watching these tournaments? Why are we still addicted to soccer or football? And I mean, for for me, on a slightly personal note, you know, I support my local football team. Uh, we're a fan-owned football club. It's like it's almost bringing it back to what it should be. But on a global scale, you yeah. know, I just find myself falling out of love with football. You know, it's it's really really. Well, the game is still wonderful, right? I mean, like, I, I love sports. I, I'm a huge baseball fan, NFL fan. I love rugby. I love soccer. Like, I watch the best of the best play because it's exciting. It's fun. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, that's the wonder of sports. But the business of sports, I mean, it's it's generally run by a whole host of awful people. Right now, as we speak, I'm a fan of the Washington Commanders, which is our NFL team. They used to be the Washington Redskins. Yep. The owner of the Washington Commanders um, is a guy named Dan Snyder. Congress right now, as we speak, is doing congressional investigations in Washington, D.C. about workplace sexual harassment and a whole host of other bad uh, actions and um, sort of corporate malfeasance that Dan Snyder has overseen during his 20 years running the court of the Washington Commanders. And yet I watch every week, every Sunday I watch him play in the NFL and I, I loathe the owner and I still watch. Now I try not to buy a year and I try not to buy tickets to the events. I just watch on TV, but he's still getting rich. And it's hard to break the habit of wanting to watch athletes play sports, even though the people who run sports are generally awful people. And I think ultimately it's, you don't want to let them win. You know, the, these sports yeah. teams belong to that community or belong to, you know, the people that have been going for years and years and, if you yeah. turn your back on it, you know, these people have succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all you can hope for is that over the course of time, these guys get held accountable. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that Dan Snyder in the United States is facing congressional hearings about the way he's run the football team and the payments he's made and the sexual harassment and stuff like that. That's a good thing, right? Like that's a step in the right direction. I'll be a lot happier if he isn't the owner one day. I think we'll all be a lot happier if people like Gianni and Tino aren't running FIFA. Um, but the fact that Sepp Blatter is on trial is a good thing. Yeah. Um, I'd like not to see reports of 6,000 people dying in Qatar. But I do think FIFA deserves a little bit of credit that the next World Cup is going to be in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. These are countries that have a significantly better history. Not a perfect, but a better history of human rights. And so FIFA has made a decision that they're going to go with a country, a, a, you know, a North American uh, World Cup that isn't in Russia, that isn't in Qatar, that isn't in Brazil. Um, that's that's a step forward. Um, but it's it does it erase everything else? No, of course not. Connor, where can people check you out? Where can the where can they listen to the podcast? 
Yeah, the, the podcast, again, is called The Lords of Soccer, How FIFA Stole the Beautiful Game. It's on pretty much every podcast application or app that you uh, are using. It's um, produced by iHeartMedia. And uh, my executive producer is a guy named Gary Scott, um, who does a bunch of podcasts as well. And his company is Inside Media or Inside Voices Media. Um, but yeah, if you just literally search on whatever podcast app you're using, Spotify, you know, Amazon, or let's say probably. Apple, just anywhere. If you just look for Lords of Soccer, you're going to find it. Thanks, man. And we, yeah, we always ask, you know, listen, uh, share it, review it, uh, and uh, just, you know, keep keep listening because if you like the first episode, the craziness of FIFA, it's only going to get crazier. And am I right in saying it's a, a weekly podcast? There's going to be one, one drop every week? Yep. We have a new episode coming out on Thursday um, uh, every week for the next uh, 11 weeks. So it's going to be... Yeah, we, we really go through the history of FIFA. We go back in time to Stanley Rouse, who was the president, to Jao Havelange. We look at Women's World Cup. We look at the 78 World Cup. And we have uh, the last episode is all about Qatar as well. And, and all of the themes sort of fit. Like, it's not a traditional podcast where there's sort of one or two characters. But people like Seth Blatter keep popping up year after year after year after year. And so, yeah, you do have some characters like Chuck Blazer and stuff like that, who make appearances throughout all of these different different episodes. Connor, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, for those Thank you have, so much. For those that have enjoyed this podcast, please go and check out uh, The Lords of Soccer and like and subscribe to this one as well.